data engineer working at Midtrans in Jakarta. Uh, but prior to that, she was working as a freelance web developer. Uh, so she's going to be talking to us about kind of the meeting between the two and building web apps for your data-driven stuff. Uh, she's passionate in making data science more accessible to everybody in you know, her free time. She enjoys various side projects, reading papers, and diving into Python in terms. Um, so with that, I'll hand over. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Um, hope everyone's enjoying the conference so far. Uh, I'm Galu, and yeah, as has been said before, I did work as a freelance web developer for a few years, and now I'm a data engineer, so I still like uh, combining like both of these fields because I think uh, it really makes data science uh, more accessible to people, which is great, and that's what I'm going to talk today, how we can build a data-driven web applications that everyone, not just data scientists, not just data analysts, can actually use. Okay, so what is a data-driven web application? Uh, what I mean by data-driven web application here are web applications which results are largely driven by data. It could be data that comes, that you already have, maybe like some data sets that you already have, or uh, data that uh, you get from external source, uh, for example, like a third-party API, or it could be data that you obtain from uh, user input. And the results here are, are various. It could be um, the data itself uh, that is display displayed to the web application. It could also be a result of a, prediction, a predictive model. It could also be like some kind of data visualization. Or it could uh, one web application may have like a combination of all of these things. So let's start with a problem using emojis. I love emojis, so you'll be seeing a lot of it today. Um, let's say that uh, you're building like some kind of a machine learning model, and it currently lives in your laptop or your in your local environment, and you already have like all of these cool data, cool insights, and let's say like. Well, your model has reached an 80% something accuracy and you're happy about it and you want to show people about uh, what you've just built. The catch is you want to show it to a lot of people and um, these people might not be just your data scientist peers, but it could also be uh, maybe your boss. Maybe you have to show it like in a meeting or it could be like someone from other departments. Um, well, what would you do at this point? Would you tell them to, oh, hey, uh, clone this uh, GitHub uh, repository or like run Jupyter Notebook even though it's, uh, you're not sure that they already know what a Jupyter Notebook is or, or they already have one? Or, hey, you know what, run Python micro model.py despite you not knowing whether they actually already have a Python environment in their laptop? And what if they actually want to play around with your model not just using the data that you already have, but you know maybe they want to input some numbers or something. It really gets complicated from here. So why don't we make web applications? And they are super cool because they allow users to actually interact with uh, your data or your research or your product, despite their um, levels of experience, despite uh, whether they actually have the environment or not. So it really makes uh, your research or your products more accessible to people. But however, when, um, when I talk about this, why don't we make a web application? Why don't you make a web application? This is really great. You really, share, you really have to share it to people. Um, there are usually some concerns that people tell me. Um, for example, it takes a lot of people to build one web application. Like uh, I, I've had a, a PhD student come up to me and say, uh, I'm a PhD student. I don't have a team of back-end developers. I don't have a team of front-end developers, like UI designers, UX researchers. Uh, now, I have the code. It lives in my laptop. I have the paper and everything, but I cannot be build the web application. But uh, this is a myth, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, usually, there is another concern. If uh, you want to build one yourself, there are so many things that you have to learn. In web development, there are lots of things going on. It seems like every day there is a new, uh, new thing that you have to learn. You have to learn React, you have to learn JavaScript, you have to learn Node.js, uh, the list is never ending. And 
um, that is all on top of all the data science stuff that you already have to learn. So it seems like there is a li an endless list of things that you have to learn just to build a web application just so you can share your work with people. But this one is also a myth. The fact is, you can definitely build one yourself. You don't need a team, no need for a front-end developer, no need for a back-end developer. And um, it doesn't have to take forever. Why? Because uh, I'll show you how we can build such web application using things that you uh, mostly already know. So here we have um, data-related libraries like scikit-learn, uh, matplotlib, and pandas. Um, which if you've done some data stuff, uh, probably you already have used a lot and we'll be using Python. And then we'll also be getting some help from Flask, which is uh, going to be the focus of our talk today. And of course you cannot escape uh, HTML and CSS, but a large part of this is Python. So if you already know, if you already know Python, I think um, I'd say you're already like uh, more than halfway into the journey. And uh, the rest, you just need to catch up with some Flask and HTML and CSS, um, which you can learn um, as you go if you've never gone uh, into web development before. And if you, if you, uh, um, well, um, I know like a lot of people, including, who still have to Google how to center a diff properly. So if that's what you're worrying about, you're in a good company. So let's talk about what we're going to be making today. Um, we'll be making a web application that allows users to input their own data. We'll be displaying some data from an outside source, such as a third-party API. We know that there are lots of uh, third-party APIs that we can use, like from Twitter or other applications that are usually used in um, researches such as sentiment analysis. And we can also display the prediction result of a model that we've trained previously. And last but not least, we want to uh, have a web application that has a graph that is dynamic, which is uh, based on the user input. Uh, just a quick check. Uh, how many of you have used Flask before? All right. How many of you have done like some data stuff before? All right. So how many of you are interested in doing more data stuff? All right, cool. <laughs> just a quick check. All right, so uh, just a little note, uh, this web application will work as a prototype or like a demo or like a simple minimum viable product because building a large web application, a scalable one, the one that people actually use in production, it's a, I, I think it's a whole different story. Um, definitely there's some trade-off if you want to build something quickly um, there might be uh, some trade-offs to that. Uh, making a huge web app uh, definitely takes a lot of time. But if your concern is you just want to get, share your work with people just so people can use it, I think um, this will uh, work well. You can use this to you know, present uh, your model in a meeting, for example, or in a hackathon. I've used that before. Uh, or like um, a dashboard for um, your paper or something. All right, so this is what we're going to make. Um, Something we can turn something that like this, like in a Jupyter notebook, or like row Python scripts into a web application like this. And um, yeah, this is a web application that I actually built for uh, my paper, the paper, one of the paper that I co-authored. Uh, so we'll be making like a simplified version of this. This uh, web application takes um, crawls. Uh, website, the crowdfunded website, and tries to determine whether based on a few factors like the number of uh, words in, contained in the story of that crowdfunding or the number of images that the crowdfunder puts, uh, will this campaign actually be um, funded or not. Uh, we'll be making a very, very simplified version of that today. Right. So. Um, the question is, why do we use Flask? Uh, I really find Flask great for uh, stuff like this, like quick web applications or prototypes, because um, unlike Django, it really only implements the bare minimum. So it gives you lots of flexibilities about what you want um, to put. For example, in Django, maybe you, you already have uh, database interfaces or like admin panels. Uh, in some cases, you may need them, but 
in other cases you may not need them at all so I find that flask gives a really great flexibility and for this from this example uh, we can even run flask from just a few lines of code this is just a few lines of code if you run flask run and you enter this URL if everything's running well you should see this in your terminal you uh, will already there's a server already running so it only takes a few lines of code in fact uh, we can just uh, build our application starting from uh, from this exact code so we can see that here in app there is um, our flash application being initialized and then the next one is we have a decorator uh, app.trout so the key, the key here is that um, this decorator is um, going to map our URL to our Python function. So in this case, uh, this decorator maps the uh, URL 127.001 slash to a Python function that is called index. And it's going to return a string hello world. And that's exactly what we are seeing in uh, our browser. Now we can add as many uh, routes as we want. So uh, let's say that we want to make another page called result. We can uh, make a function, and then since this is just a regular Python function, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a regular Python function, so you can definitely put uh, things like variables in it. So let's say that you want to return a variable called result, and then you put like some number in it, and then you return that, uh, you will see that in your web application, in your browser. The variable that you have just assigned in your Python function. <coughs> right, so when we talk about building web applications, of course, we don't want to return just strings or objects, but what we want to return is an actual web page um, uh, using HTML. And luckily, Flask uh, already has a very convenient way of doing that. We can use the method render template and we can just pass the name of the web page to the method. So let's say I want to return a web page called index.html. And here um, we don't have our web page yet, so let's create one. Flask will automatically try to find uh, templates, uh, sorry, web pages uh, in the, the folder called templates. So, we should make one there, template slash, let's say, index.html. And let's try to return the same text, hello world, but with, uh, with heading so we can see that the difference. And we can see that it is rendered in our web page as an uh, HTML. How if we want to pass some variables? If you want to pass some variables, um, it's also very convenient. Let's say we have a, uh, our variable result is equal to Oh, what is that? 100,000. And um, we will just pass that to the render template. And here we are passing the, uh, we are passing the variable here. And this is the parameter name, the one in green. So you can have, uh, both, you can, both of these names can be uh, different. Uh, the green one is just a matter of what you're going to call your the var the variable that you're passing in the HTML page and you can see that it is being rendered. Okay, so at this point, we still haven't found a way to make um, users able to interact with our web application. So let's just do that. We can do that with um, HTML form. Say we have a form, uh, you can actually um, have like oh, something other than text built let's say checkboxes or like radio buttons, drop downs. But in this case, uh, let's stick with a simple um, input text field. And what we're going to do is we're going to send the data that the user inputs to uh, the root that we have just created earlier, which is slash result. So we can just write that the action is uh, equal to slash result and the method is get since we're just um, trying to retrieve um, some uh, data not changing the state so we don't need to use post whatsoever and we can see that when it's being when anything is being entered to the form we can see that uh, we are being directed to the result page but in this uh, in this case we still um, haven't caught the user input yet so we're still returning the old value from the previous slide which, uh, but we're going to, that, to do that next. So, uh, yeah, 
here we're trying to catch the input that the user has just put to the text field. Uh, Flask has something called request, and in this case, our request, uh, what request does is that it parses the query string, which is uh, the URL here. Let's say I put the campaign name as some campaign. Now, re what request.arc does is that it parses the query string to a multidict. So we'll have a dictionary called uh, dictionary a dictionary that contains campaign uh, as the key and the value is some campaign. And to get that, we can just use the key. And at this point, we already know what the user uh, is giving us as an input, and we can use that further for uh, our application. Let's say if you want to pass that. Um, variable to our web page, we can see that it is rendered in um, our web page, some campaign. Now let's try to get some data. We can use this uh, input that we have just got to, let's say, if you want to retrieve a particular data of some campaign from a third-party API. Let's say the crowdfunded website has a very convenient API that returns the data that we need for our predictive model. Um, something like these, maybe they already have like the story word count whatsoever, number of images. We can just use um, the data that we have just got. We can just hit that to the um, API. And in this case, I'm using URLib to read, the, to read the data and to load the JSON. And we are, when we try to uh, render that to our web page, we can see that it is being rendered nicely in our web page. Well, not very nicely, but we'll deal with that later. But at least we know that we can already get what the user inputs and we can already get the data according to whatever it is that the user input. For example, if the user inputs like another campaign called another campaign, uh, such data will be, the data of that campaign will be returned here. All right. So, we already have the data according to the user input. Now, maybe the next thing that we want to do is we uh, what to do with our model. Because we already have a model, let's say, from a Jupyter Notebook or something. Now, uh, we want to serve that in a web application. But how are we going to do that? So um, when you're building a model, if you're using a Jupyter Notebook, this is what you usually have. You usually have a static data set. Um, called uh, a CSV maybe, and then you load that using pandas, and you separate that into training and testing set. And in this case, um, I have a let's say I want to build a model using random forest. So uh, this is what I'm using, and I'm using Scikit-Learn in this uh, example. So the rf.fit, this is where I'm doing my training using my training data, and uh, usually after that uh, we would. Uh, do some prediction, we would do some prediction with our tasting data to see if uh, our model is performing well or not. Let's say I want to measure that using RMSE or R squared. And at this point, if we're not yet satisfied with the result of our model, let's say the error is too big, um, we can uh, just run this particular block and um, the random forest block uh, over and over again until we get a satisfying result, maybe with a different parameters or maybe uh, with a different method. But when we want to serve that to our web application, we only want to use one model with the best accuracy or like the smallest error. Well, I don't know about you, but um, I think for me, I think that's, that's something that I definitely want to use. I don't want to serve uh, my users um, a model with uh, the worst accuracy or something. So we only want to use that one particular model that we are, the, which um, result we are happy with. And another thing is that, of course, we do not we do not want to retrain our model every time a new request hits our web application. So um, in the previous example here, we have uh, rf.fit, which is the training part. And usually, this training part can, um, depending on your data or depending on the method that you use, it can be, um, it can take a very, very long time. And we're sure we don't want to do that. We just want the model to do some prediction, like given some new data, just predict um, according to this model. I, we don't, we don't want the model to retrain it over and over again. So, uh, the answer is we have to make it persistent. And there are a few ways of doing this. In a language level, 
Python has something called Pickle, which is a module uh, which purpose is to serialize and deserialize a Python object structure. So this could be um, any object structure. It doesn't have a it doesn't have to be a scikit uh, model from scikit-learn or something. And uh, there is another way which is called joblib, which is a library providing utilities for pipelining Python jobs. And one of the utility is to load and save uh, an object, so we can use that. Or we can use each library's specific method. For example, if you use libsvm for um, SVM, there is a method called SVM save model and SVM load model. And if you're using TensorFlow in Python, there is something called tf.train.saver class, which you can use. Uh, however, uh, it really depends. So for example, uh, in scikit-learn, they don't have a, sp I, I think they don't have a specific method, but they just tell us to either choose between pickle and joblib. And um, however, they say um, it's preferable to use joblib because there are some issues in pickle. So the best bet is to check um, each library's documentation. Usually they have a very specific um, section on model persistence or loading and saving your model. <coughs> So in this case, I'm going to use Joblib because it's the one that is recommended by Scikit-Learn. So this is my model, random first regressor. Let's say that uh, I'm already happy with this particular model with these particular par parameters, and I train it. And after I finish training it, I can just save it, save it to a file called model.sap here. And this is uh, what's going on in my Jupyter notebook. And if I want to use that to our Python application, um, I create a function called getPredition, which accepts the data that we already got from our third-party API, which we're going to use as the features. And if you want to use the model, we can just use the model uh, using joblib.load, and we insert the file name of the model. So after this, we can use the model just as we usually use it in, uh, in our Jupyter Notebook or like um, our raw script. We can just call predict and we can just insert the data that we already um, get from the third uh, party API or any data that you want to use as features. And after that, we can get in here, what we're trying to predict is the predicted amount, like the amount of money that the campaign will get based on the features such as a word, uh, number of words or number of images. And here we already have the uh, predicted amount, which we can use um, in our web application. So yeah, this is, um, we get the prediction. This is uh, the prediction data, which contains the amount and um, a Boolean if it's funded or not. And if we uh, render that to our web application, uh, still not looking good. Uh, this tile is not looking good, but we'll get there later. Um, we can see that there's the amount. Oh, it's predicted the amount is going to be uh, this, uh, and it's predicted that it's not going to be um, funded. However, there are some pitfalls that we have to take notes of. The first one is that since we are saving and loading data, we have to make sure that you're loading only trusted data. So. Um, it's advisable do not like download like some random model that you don't know where it comes from. The reason why is because um, this uh, file could contain like some malicious code that um, if it's executed to our web app, of course we don't want that. So uh, only make sure that you're loading uh, trusted data, for example, like data that you save yourself. The next one is um, saving a model using a particular version of the library and loading it using another version might give. So um, sadly, I think um, this, uh, this is kind of inevitable because at some point of time, of course, you'll have to upgrade your library. Uh, so uh, what should we do at this point? Uh, the first one is that if uh, you want to save and load your data, always keep uh, the training data that you use to train your model. So. Do not discard it yet. Always keep um, a copy of that. And the second one is that keep the source code that generates the model. So even though you already have your cool lab application, maybe you do not want to discard your raw scripts yet. And also keep uh, track of the version of the library used and also the dependencies used uh, at that time, as well as the cross-validation score 
that she obtained when you train that model using the training data. This way, you can, uh, if you upgrade your library, you can uh, try to run that model again using the exact training data and using um, and see if the cross-validation that results when you use this new uh, version of the library is in the same range of the old cross-validation score. So if, uh, if there is a difference, then maybe uh, there might be something wrong with uh, your model and maybe you want to have to. You'll have to retrain your model again using the new version. Okay, so let's move along to data visualization. Um, usually when we run our data visualization in Jupyter Notebook, uh, this is how it looks like. This, is a, this graph doesn't mean anything, so it's just for a demonstration purpose. Um, yeah, usually when we plot, uh, when we do uh, plt.plot using matplotlib, um, we will have our data visualization displayed in our Jupyter Notebook. Um, however, what if we want to serve this graph in our web application? Maybe you think, oh, you know, uh, just copy the image and save the image and uh, load that in our web application. But what if you want, let's say, to have like one of these values be dependent on uh, some kind of user input? What if we don't want it to be one, two, three, four, five? But uh, if uh, what if we want the array to depend on the user input? And of course, we cannot just save the image and load that. So there has to be another way. And when I had to do this, I instantly thought, oh, maybe I should have like some kind of a JavaScript library or something to make it more dynamic. But then that would take a long time because uh, I'd have to learn a new JavaScript library over and over again. Um, but it turns out you can totally do that on using only matplotlib, which is something that um, we are already familiar with. So that's great news. So in this case, I, I create a new um, file a new function called getplotURL and let's say that we want one of the values to be dependent on user input. Now the idea here is that we want to save our graph to a string and um, in this case we are going to use string IO which will hold um, our image and then we are going to use that to we're going to use uh, string IO and encode, they encode that in base64. So we're encoding it to base64 so that it can be safely sent to, uh, let's say, a URL, part of URL. Um, at this point, uh, we'll talk about later how we can uh, turn this string into an image in our web application. But this is all the data that we have, uh, we need to have right now. So yeah, when you try to render it to your web page, it's going to look really ugly. It's, there's going to be a very long string um, going on, but don't worry. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So let's try to put everything together. We already have uh, our data um, that comes from an external source. We already have the results of our machine learning model. We already have uh, data visualization that can accept user input, which is great. And let's uh, put everything together. So uh, as we can see, uh, what we are returning uh, is a dictionary like data. Uh, and if you want to get a particular value, since it's a dictionary, we can just use the, the key. Let's say we want to get the value of the story word count. We can just uh, call that using the, as, the non, as the name of the key. And so is uh, same thing with prediction. It's mostly straightforward. So when you do that, you will get something like this. So all of the values are already rendered instead of like as a dictionary or as an, as an object, um, since we are getting like each uh, value, we can, it, it makes it easier for us to style it. Let's say if you want to have some bullets or something. So how about our graph? So remember that we had like this really ugly long string. Um, usually when we want to load an image in HTML, we do image source uh, equal to uh, the path to the image. But what we have right now is not a regular image. It's uh, what we have right now is something called uh, data URL. So data URL um, enables us to embed the data that we have uh, right in line. So we don't need to like, uh, as if like it's, uh, it comes from an external source. And the uh, great thing is that um, when we uh, have data URL, we don't have to like save our graph 
uh, to or host it somewhere. We just need to um, we can generate it on the fly, which is what we are doing. So here, uh, instead of like image source image path .png, we have to specify that this is a data URL, and we specify that this uh, data URL is encoded in Base64. And uh, when we uh, render that to the web page, it will be rendered just as like any other image, but the difference is when you have a different input, um, it can make a different image. So it is generated on the fly. So um, there are lots of things uh, that you can do with um, Flask. Um, you don't need to have a fancy JavaScript framework if you want to do more some more advanced stuff. Well, maybe you will have to at some point, but uh, most of the time, I think, especially for demos or like proof of concepts, uh, this is uh, mostly enough. And um, this is all to thanks to Flask templating engine, which is called Jinja2. And Jinja2 allows us to put like some logic to um, our web page. So let's say in this case, uh, it, there is a for loop there, and we can use that in our view. So there are lots of Jinja2 examples in the documentation. Um, here are some examples that I have. Let's say that I want to um, have a different color for uh, my prediction. If I predict, if the model predicts that uh, it is going to be funded, I want the um, color to be, let's say, um, green. And if it's not funded, I want the color to be red. So let's add some simple uh, CSS here that uh, specifies that we have a class prediction, we have a class called funded, and um, if the color is green, and if not funded, the color is going to be red. So this is what well, we are going to write in our HTML. We can use some conditionals there. Basically, this is like saying, hey, um, if if I have the data, uh, if, the, if I have the value of prediction is predicted as true, then please write uh, the word funded in my span class. Otherwise, please uh, write not funded. And when, uh, when it is rendered, you will see that, oh, um, if, it's, if it's predicted returns true, it will just write prediction funded. Otherwise, if uh, is predicted returns, um, sorry, it should be false. Uh, then uh, it will return a uh, prediction not funded. So um, this is an example. The example here uh, shows that the amount is, uh, is uh, predicted as not going to be funded, so we'll have it as a, uh, with red color. And if we see the web inspector, we'll see that it's just rendered as prediction not funded. Instead of like prediction funded not funded, it's just written as prediction not funded because it acts uh, according to um, according to the uh, is uh, funded value. Another thing is called custom filters. Um, let's say that we have lots of uh, amounts of money going on and it's a little bit hard to read, like uh, it's uh, kind of hard to read. So let's say that we want to format that using a currency uh, and with some separators. We can easily do that we can uh, have another function called format currency in our app.py file. And what uh, this uh, decorator does is it maps the name of the function to the actual function itself. So let's say that this function accepts the value and it will return a formatted value, a formatted um, string of uh, the value that is given. So we can see here, um, how are we going to use that? We just need to write the name of the um, filter um, after this pipe. And when you see that, the uh, filter already works. So it's very, very simple. It's very easy. And it's, uh, I, it's very, very useful, especially if you want to, let's say you want the data to return an integer because um, you need to do some computation, but you need it to be displayed as a string. So. It's a very, very helpful. And there are lots of other uses of custom filters. So what's next? Um, uh, after this, there are lots of things that you can do. Let's say that you already have your Flask uh, application ready. You can first maybe deploy it and share it with the world. There are lots of ways to deploy your um, Flask application. And Flask already has a great documentation on this. 
uh, I usually go with Heroku, but you can also uh, use Google App Engine, and there are also many other options in the Flask documentation. And then the second one is you can add some more functionalities. For example, uh, Flask has an extension called Flask Admin. Maybe if you want to manage some users in your web application, or if you want your web application to be accessible to only certain people, you can have Flask plugin. So anyone that needs to access your application has to have the right credentials. And maybe if you want, if you have some time, you can make it more interactive. Um, there are lots of uh, boilerplates such as a Flask React. If you're, if you want to learn some JavaScript, if you want, if you have some time and you want to um, enhance your application even more, you can use that like Flask React and maybe use other uh, JavaScript uh, libraries, or you can maybe make it more scalable. Let's say. Um, you want the, this to be used uh, in production, I think uh, obviously you will probably need to have a team or, for that, but at least you already have a proof of concept working, and uh, which is great. So at this point, there are lots of things that uh, you can do. Right, so that's it, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes for questions. There are any? If not, great. Hey. Thanks once again. Thank you. Uh, it's time for a tea break, everybody.